really uh, thank the organizers uh, for inviting me and also for tolerating uh, the ICE delay of about an hour. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's the first meeting, I think the first real meeting I'm, I'm going to, maybe the second uh, since COVID, so it's always interesting. Uh, so I, I decided uh, at, at this talk to actually take the, the title of the workshop seriously. And, and I'm gonna talk about molecular magnetism and uh, it's like basically the subject of a collaboration that's been going on for a long time uh, with my old uh, group in London. Uh, but of course, it also has collaborators uh, at, uh, at Oxford and, and elsewhere uh, now. Uh, so motivation, of course, is, is uh, from my childhood. Uh, you could get these Lego bricks. Uh, and of course, they could also be actually have little maggots in them like our uh, name tags, which I thought actually the maggots were quite strong to uh, having to take it apart. So that motivates uh, sort of thinking about molecular magnetism. And the fact what you'd like to do is, is you'd like to, to do quantum uh, magnetic Lego rather than classical magnetic Lego, which you could do according to that website I just showed you. And I'm just going to uh, take you through uh, first a little bit of materials science. Uh, and, and then at the end, uh, tell you how actually this is now leading up to uh, interesting uh, control of the magnetic interactions uh, in a molecular Lego fashion, uh, both uh, by stacking and then uh, presumably also by phonons, which we haven't done yet, and also uh, via optics. Uh, so. So take this as, as a bit of a tour uh, through a slightly different world than, than the quantum anybody physics world uh, that we all uh, are used to. Uh, there's very many actually bricks that are, have been advertised recently. Obviously the most famous ones are the van der Waals uh, bricks, which uh, as we know, we can layer on top of each other to have all kinds of interesting behavior, especially if we twist them. Of course, that was preceded by nanotubes and, and buckyballs. Uh, but actually, uh, there's there's a brick which is far more ubiquitous uh, in chemistry, and, and that's uh, corporan uh, molecules of this type. These are ring molecules, uh, uh, which 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 have uh, incredible uh, flexibility. Uh, you know, sort of bunch of uh, carbons and hydrogens around, and that, but in the middle of these rings, you can put essentially whatever you like, uh, magnetic and non-magnetic transition metals, for instance. And uh, they're everywhere. I mean, they're exceptionally stable, they're modular, they're made by the ton. Uh, it's essentially, if you wish, sort of the silicon of, for chemists rather than for uh, electric engineers. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's being touted for organic solar and it's just cheap, modular, easy to process. Uh, so that's, that's what it is. And, and they come in all kinds of uh, different colors, depending, of course, on the metal atom that you put in the middle. And, and they also uh, crystallize in all different ways, which, I, which is interesting. So these units have uh, numerous uh, polymorphs and depending on the growth conditions, uh, they come out with uh, different uh, stackings and, and uh, these stackings uh, uh, actually can be changed, uh, particularly the, 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 the angles of the stacking can be changed depending on just trivial annealing conditions. And uh, so you actually can control, uh, if you wish, the translation of, of the molecules rel relative to each other. Uh, and depending on what you put underneath these molecules, for example, you can put templating molecules underneath. This is, looks like actually a graphene fragment, which is correct. So if you, if you deposit these on essentially these PPCDA fragments, uh, then you can get these things to lie flat on a, on a surface. Uh, other, in other cases, they lie perpendicular to the surface. So there's a lot of flexibility here, and one can take all kinds of electron micrographs. And uh, uh, the materials people who prepare these uh, can, you know, either use a standard uh, vapor deposition or they can uh, use two furnaces essentially to create uh, all kinds of other polymorphs at the end of their tubes. You can make wires out of these things. So you have the full. Uh, flexibility uh, of the fabrication. And in fact, one can take advantage, for example, of that flexibility. Uh, you can make solar cells, very popular. I'm not, that's a sort of old story. Uh, 
you can also make these these nanowires and you can actually even uh, create uh, nanowire uh, uh, nanowire transistors let me just move ahead a little bit here uh, let me just show you how you can make transistors you essentially uh, drape a nanowire between the source and the drain I have a back gate here this is just some some substrate uh, it's very much analogous to a MOSFET and and by depositing these things these nanowires uh, uh, on such a substrate which has these uh, patterned electrodes on it uh, you can get actually extremely nice uh, switching characteristics actually much nicer switching characteristics uh, for wires uh, than you get for films and you can see that in the, in the performance you know the, the standard performance metric the switching field here for the wires is just a, a few volts whereas uh, switching fields for the for the uh, 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 the films uh, polycrystalline films are, are, are substantially larger so the point is that uh, these things exist these bricks exist in, in nature uh, and actually chemists make them by the ton and they have a lot of flexibility and, and now the question is is why am I telling you about this so of course the reason I'm telling you about this these bricks is that these bricks contain uh, little magnets and let me just uh, review some of the properties of these little magnets we learned about over the last decade or so a uh, uh, very simple brick is one containing copper as you know from we've worked on the high tc problem uh, copper two plus is a very simple atom and it's also very simple when you insert it in uh, basically thalassinine and and uh, one nice thing you can do uh, if with this uh, mb uh, that you can apply to these molecules is you can make thin films uh, with various concentrations of these molecules and particularly you can dilute them way down so then you can have essentially a solid where there are very few of these spins and so the interactions uh, would start out being weak and so you can isolate the individual molecules and study those and those uh, individual uh, molecules have you know, very nice uh, spin a half degree of, uh, of, of freedom uh, and nice resonances is just expand you know, 10 gigahertz uh, EPR. And of course, the question is, well, uh, this rather dirty system, uh, could it actually store information? And that's a, a natural question to ask is, uh, would these function either as classical bits or qubits? Uh, you know, can you do uh, simple magnetism with them? And of course, we, we uh, asked these questions once we were able to make these films. And we measured, of course, both the T1 spin lattice relaxation times and the dephasing times. It turns out that actually the, the classical data survives for an extremely long time. So this stuff that you have essentially in paint actually has extremely long uh, spin. Uh, lattice uh, relaxation time so classical information certainly lasts a very long time and surprisingly actually this these molecules have been around i don't know for 100 years nobody had really bothered to do these kinds of measurements until 2013 uh, and, and of course that relaxation time uh, depends very strongly on the concentration so this is 0.1 percent uh, copper thalassinine in the film and then going up to 10 and of course you you, you usually shorten these times this is just t1 yeah, yeah. You usually shorten mm -hmm. these times because of course these things uh, uh, cross relax each other uh, quantum data actually survives also for an amazingly long time at amazingly high temperatures again for something which is uh, this uh, dirty uh, and this actually just shows you the the, the spin echo uh, that you get and, and it lasts basically for t2 times or basically a border uh, uh, microseconds and and of course there's there's uh, of course a lot of fine structure that you get here as well because they're nuclear spins uh, from the nitrogen atoms which surround the copper atoms as well so there's a lot of very nice sort of EPR that you can do and again the t2 times uh, decay as you start to uh, as you start to add impurities but remarkably these are these are uh, these are these are rather amazingly long uh, times, you know, for a solid. Uh, oh, this is about it, it basically. Uh, this is low temperatures. If you if 
acute calvin, but it doesn't change much uh, up to 60 and then it goes, it, it, it goes, goes down. At room temperature, they're still quite respectable. And so these, these uh, I don't want to make this a subject of the talk because these are rather old data, but, but in fact, uh, the T2 types are remarkable at, at, as you raise the temperature, actually these materials are better than most things we know about, which is surprising. But in any case, that's, that was, that's basically saying that these LIGO bricks contain uh, quantum, little quantum magnets that we can then play with as we did with LIGO when we were kids. Uh, one play, uh, of course, that one could do is one can convince uh, oneself that these are really nice quantum spins by, by measuring Rabi oscillations, which we did here in the, in the, in the usual way uh, of you know, varying the, the length of the, uh, the length of the pulses can of course also vary the, the uh, the amplitude of the pulses, but they're, they're nice lobbies, as you, as you many lobbies you can see. Uh, so these are little brick, little quantum bricks, actually. Now, and so now, uh, following basically along the very nice talk we had before, you have these bricks, and now you want to get them to interact with each other. And uh, it turns out here, uh, I told you at the beginning that the, the these thalassinine molecules are the property that that you can actually have actually rather exceptional control of the stacking over the polymer. And, and depending on the stacking, actually, and I didn't uh, emphasize enough, is actually the optical properties change slightly. So there's, there's something changing about the electronic structure also, in particular, of course, the electronic structure to do with the overlap going along the stacking direction. And, and uh, you would, have, of course, uh, expect as we also learned in the previous talk, that there would be some forms of chain magnetism, which would depend on the exchange interactions that might occur between these uh, uh, transition metal uh, atoms sitting in the middle of these ring molecules. So be, you know, obviously there could be antiferromagnetic or thermonetic interactions. And uh, actually what we have in here is, is actually a molecular analog of, a, of the arc of the Y interaction in metals. So basically, uh, these are pi systems, organics, and they're polarized by the, uh, basically, interactions with the transition metal spin. Okay. And so then these excitations actually can transfer to the neighbor. And so you have essentially a, a, an exchange interaction which has to do, uh, basically, uh, with a transfer integral uh, between uh, different uh, different molecules in a in a particular stack, and then these are various uh, Coulomb interactions, uh, and and then and then there's of course this exchange integral here, and and uh, you combine all of these things and you get a, an interaction here. Notice that uh, the sign of course can be either positive or negative, and so. You can actually then imagine that by sliding the molecules over each other, as you change the tilt angle of these stacks, that you can change these parameters. And, and sure enough, actually, again, this is the first measurement we, we did. Uh, we were able to show that as we change the polymorph simply by, uh, in, in, by annealing conditions or by templating, uh, you could dramatically change uh, the collective magnetism. So before we were talking about the single particles, the single bricks, now it's depending on which object we assemble out of the bricks, you can get quite different behaviors. For instance, with even already the copper, it's very interesting is with the copper uh, for uh, one polymorph, these are now just Curie-Weiss laws, right? So if, if you have non-interacting spins, it should just be a straight line uh, crossing uh, the origin. Uh, obviously, if they interact, then you can read off the interactions uh, by the displacement of the intercept from the origin. And, and you can see, just by changing the polymorph, you can change this thing from essentially being some kind of a quantum uh, antiferromagnet, basically a very nice spin a half chain I showed you before, a very, very nice quantum spin a half degrees of freedom in each brick. You stack them, then you get a this antiferromagnet, uh, one way you get an antiferromagnet, uh, antiferromagnetic interaction. Of course, it doesn't order because it's going to have to change. Uh, but if, in, on the other hand, uh, for other preparations, uh, you, can, you actually get an intercept close to zero. So you can actually cancel the interactions between these, uh, these spins uh, with very high degree just by, just with very simple uh, laboratory procedures.
images. This shows also, of course, magnetization versus, uh, versus uh, field, which goes along with this. As you can see, of course, that the, that the, the, uh, these films where you have uh, this dense array of, of copper atoms, it's almost the perfect real function here. Uh, and then, uh, which is this uh, red line here. But of course, if uh, for the antiphonometric chain, of course, you have to defeat the exchange interaction uh, with a magnetic field to no longer get the real function. So that, that was sort of remarkable at the time. And, and so we're actually able, essentially, in this case, to tune the magnetism with the polymorph. And we can also tune uh, the magnetism in other ways by replacing a transition metal. Uh, this shows you, uh, again, a comparison between one polymorph, the manganese Faustine single crystal, uh, which is here in the form of the, the squares. That turns out, this is one over chi, so this diverges at around 10 degrees. So that turns out to be a ferromagnet, a fairly high TC. If you, if you make it uh, into, a, into a film, into a film polymorph, it again, actually, it actually trends towards being a, a high spin uh, antivalidity chain. And so this is, this is all rather, uh, rather remarkable. Uh, you can put in cobalt, the cobalt actually converts this to an S equals one Haldane system. And uh, this antiferromagnetic exchange, what's interesting about the cobalt is the exchange actually for cobalt is much larger than it is for copper. So you can see that the Curie Weiss intercept is, is going up over uh, 200, uh, 300 degrees here. And, and again, by, by stacking the bricks differently, you can get those interactions to vanish. But so uh, this actually then called for some calculations to see you know, whether one could actually understand this uh, very simple uh, behavior. It's very easy to describe it to you uh, as, as an experimentalist and, and, and uh, to actually try to understand why uh, these things are so sensitive to the, uh, 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 to why, why the interactions, both the sign and the magnitude, they're so sensitive to the, how much I slide these things or twist them with respect to each other and why things change so much depending on the orbital. Well, if we talk about the orbital first, so copper turns out the copper wave functions are simply much smaller than the cobalt. So that's sort of easy. But the other thing is that happens is that these overlap integrals, T of course is an overlap integral, which in some sense is some kind of an interferogram, which you're sort of familiar now with when you think about uh, the, uh, the twisted bilayers, graphene, right? By, uh, things change very dramatically, right? When you take two graphene sheets over each other like this. Well, they also change very dramatically when I take two of these organic organic chunks or organic legal breaks. And, and essentially from this interferogram, I can get all the variation in exchange constant, uh, both, both the magnitude and the sign by, by looking at essentially these overlap integrals, which are interferograms of the underlying wave functions. So this, I think in, the, in miniature in some sense actually is, is a molecular uh, representation uh, of a lot of stuff we're actually also seeing in, in the twisted bilayer graphene. And, and this shows you actually, uh, when you actually go to calculate these exchange interactions uh, as a function of the sliding angle, which is when you take these two molecules and uh, slide them over each other. And you can see here, uh, actually can, uh, it's remarkable as accurate, we're actually able, these are the experimental data points here for the exchange interaction. So with DFT, we're actually able to, to get these uh, get these numbers and see that they vary by orders of magnitude. Okay, uh, not surprisingly, actually, there are also iron-based ferromagnets. It turns out that there's there there's also uh, some control over the the anisotropy, of course, because there is spin orbit coupling for some of these uh, elements. Uh, you get away from copper, uh, then you can actually also control the anisotropy of, of of these uh, magnets, again, by how you deposit them on the surface. I, I'm not gonna talk about this. This is a paper we, we just uh, we published just before the lockdown. Uh, it's especially interesting is the nanowires have actually very high coercive uh, forces. 
Um, and again, these systems, these iron uh, uh, thalcyanine uh, uh, stacks uh, have uh, Curie Weiss at high temperature. Again, the uh, exchange interactions are controlled by the polymorph. And uh, the nanowires, for example, have actually quite a large exchange interaction, something like 30 uh, Kelvin or so. And uh, what's interesting is, uh, is that at low temperatures, you actually need to plot the data, not as a Curie-Weiss, but as a super Curie-Weiss, because this is now a one-dimensional ferromagnet. And so you actually plot chi inverse versus, versus G squared. And of course, what's happening in what, why is it one over T squared rather than one over T? Of course, uh, you can remember effectively as you cool a, a 1D chain down, a thermodynamic chain down, you're getting a correlation of uh, uh, bigger and bigger spins as it were, the correlation length is increasing, of course, as you cool down linearly with T. So the number of spins that contribute to the Curie law essentially goes up like one over T. And then you still have your Curie laws, you have one over T squared. And you get actually perfect chain behavior over a very large range of T squared here. So these are very nice one-dimensional ferromagnetic chains. And these ferromagnetic chains actually have interesting behavior when you look at the in the field temperature plane, because they, these ferromagnetic chains, of course, have topological defects. They have solitons. Because of course, if I, I I just told you in words before that I have these chunks, uh, it's this one over T squared is telling me I have chunks of spins, which are essentially T law, you know, essentially one over T long, so they contain one over T spins, essentially. And then, and then now I'm, and then there's a, the, then there's some kind of a, 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 a domain wall, and then they, they point in the other direction. And, and of course, you regulate the population of these, of these domain walls with an external magnetic field. And, and, and one can actually measure essentially the derivative of these, uh, the, the temperature derivative of the population of these domain walls, essentially uh, by uh, measuring uh, the susceptibility in the, in the field temperature plane. So we have these very nice ridges, which come from these uh, topological excitations. And so the physics is described really by solitons, 1D domain wall separating regions, which are ordered of course is oppressed from inorganic systems, ages ago, but it's in this system, it's extremely uh, cleanly illustrated. And one can compare this essentially with the old theories, which are contemporary with the sushi or Heger model uh, and essentially get a very nice, uh, very nice agreement and very good uh, values uh, for the various parameters. So there's two types of uh, domain walls, of course. Uh, uh, there's basically an out of plane uh, uh, rotation like this, which, which of course, uh, which turns out to give you a straight line in the magnetic field temperature plane that I just showed you. And uh, one, one has also a, uh, a block type wall here uh, where you have an in-plane rotation, which gives you this, uh, this uh, square root uh, uh, behavior or a parabola in the HT plane for the, for this, uh, the, the, the singularity that uh, that the susceptibility is uh, the susceptibility. <coughs> so, uh, so physics described essentially just to make it clear, it's described into bicycle topological excitation. So that's a very nice thing to do with these bricks. Now, I've shown you the magnetic interactions are controlled by stacking. I've shown you little magnets inside each brick. Uh, let me talk about optical control of the magnets. But so the dream here is obviously that you have these bricks here, left and right, copper thalassinin, for example, but it could be some other spin. And then in between, you have some control bit, which allows you to uh, control the interactions uh, between, these, uh, between these fellows. So that's sort of the standard gate-based model for uh, quantum computing, or in fact, for any magnet. And, and ideally, you'd like just to flash it with light. And, and if you, uh, if you sort of conceptually think as well, you shine light on this control bit, and then it makes these two guys, it makes it somehow bigger, and then it makes these guys interact. So how do you implement that in practice with these bricks? Well, we actually take three bricks now. We have one break in the middle here. And 
and then we hang little bricks off of it. Now these these are actually bricks, not so big bricks anymore, but these are easier to put on. Uh, these are just uh, uh, tempos, essentially, tempo molecules, which are very standard uh, chimeratic resonance labels, uh, very well known to chemists. We just hang two of these off the side. So each of these uh, basically has uh, an O, and then as you know, there's then a free, a free electron, a free spin here, and a free spin here. And you choose for the brick in the middle, you choose something that's inert to start with. So these guys hopefully are not interacting. But they're very, they have very nice TT times. And, and then what you do is you excite the brick. The, the, the concept is actually that somehow you can excite this brick in the middle and then couple up the spin that lives over on this fellow and that fellow. And uh, let me just show you how, how this uh, is essentially uh, thought to work is uh, this shows. Uh, the whole uh, molecule, and uh, if I if I now were to uh, just look at the molecular orbitals for this, that's what they look like there. Uh, if I look at this, uh, if I build this up uh, step by step, I, I think of of course attaching now a free radical uh, to this side and creating this mono tempo spin label. Uh, there's spins basically starting out over here. Uh, but what I'd like to do is then optically uh, generate this excited state in the middle. I showed you here, I had just the porphyrin molecule without the add-ons here, without the spins. And of course, if I excite this thing optically, I create electron hole pairs in this whole entity. And I then create essentially a spin, a, a spin I can create a spinful object which occupies entire molecule starts up with zero spin and then after an inner system crossing I wind up actually to get a spin one on this object and uh, the point is that what I'm what I'm trying to do uh, with this optical excitation is coupling up uh, the spins over here uh, with the spins over here so if I uh, excite optically the idea is then to create a composite s equals one half s equals one and S equals a half object. So there's the S equals a half, the S equals a half, S equals one in the middle. And, and then that will then essentially have, a, that will result in an optically switchable Hamiltonian uh, where I essentially couple the spin, the triplet here in the middle, which is optically excited uh, with the doublet here, and uh, likewise the doublet here. So, let me just, just tell you a little bit about you know, the underlying physics here, that, uh, just to repeat it. So I have a laser. Uh, I have this big molecule uh, consisting of three bricks, big brick in the middle and then two on either side, smaller ones. And of course, uh, I then create basically this electron hole pair excitation in the middle. And, and then I have, of course, uh, the possibility, since I have an S equals one plus S equals a half plus S equals a half, I can have you know, different states, S equals zero, S equals one, and S equals two made up out of that, right? Because a half, a half plus, plus one is two, for example, and uh, a half, a half minus one is zero. And, and so uh, the idea then is, is, is that somehow this system relaxes after a time uh, to one of these states here, and then, and then uh, it, this is much longer lived, this relaxation. And so one can actually uh, just schematically show the experiment in this slide. Uh, here's my, this tempo molecule. I excited with a 3.3 EV light to generate my triplet, and then uh, these doublets become coupled. Uh, I can then come later and de-excite this, and then essentially freeze the uh, relative uh, states of the, of the two doublets. That's, that's, the, that's the scheme. And so there's some due diligence one has to do first. Uh, so the first thing uh, we did was just to do time resolved photoluminescence, just to see what the time scale was for the inner system crossing so that uh, to establish this new state. And, and this just shows the photoluminescence uh, intensity. This is just, the, this is actually a very simple experiment. I mean, this is just a tenth of a nanosecond 
uh, uh, laser uh, pulse excitation again. As I said, a 3.3 EV, as you put this bistempo molecule, you get the mechanics, you throw it at the toluene, they cool it down to, to, to about uh, 50 degrees or so. And this shows that, that uh, essentially the resistant crossing is over within a few nanoseconds. Then you can do transient electron paramagnetic resonance. And uh, I'm just going to show you uh, what changes when we uh, actually look at this uh, molecule uh, uh, basically first without the two spin a half. So remember what I'm going to try to do is make a composite object out of a spin a, a two spin a halves and a spin one. So I just want to study first to make sure I understand the spin one object in the middle. So I don't I remove the, the, the free radicals at the end. And this shows me essentially that this S equal to one is state is actually amazingly long lived. So I, I go to this homoluma excitation of the molecule and I have very nice EPR. This is the EPR that I get essentially for a, a powder average of, a spin, of this particular spin one molecule. We can see that it takes actually a very long time for the molecule to relax back down uh, to, to its ground state. So this is four to uh, 50 nanoseconds is the shortest time to perform this at. And this of course uh, go, goes all the way out to, to milliseconds. We're not trying to be excited here. Of course you could not try to be excited with a laser. Uh, the interesting thing that happens when I add the two uh, spins at either end, is the EPR signal changes. You, you notice here, oops, very sharp cutoff. And then over here, I actually get these tails. And this just shows you just to average a bit more at the, the appearance of these tails, uh, basically down here, basically here to the left, there's one, and to the right, there's one. And in fact, uh, this is now the direct evidence that we optically generated this composite object. And the, uh, the, you can go ahead and fit these data and uh, get, uh, come to the result that you actually have a 300 megahertz uh, antiferminic exchange interaction between the spin one and the spin half at either side, right? Of course, means that the net interaction between the, the two spins a half is, is, uh, is, is of course, ferromagnetic as you square that. But this is, this, is, this is basically the beginning now of optical control of exchange interactions just by essentially creating it, fabricating it by hand uh, using, using simple molecules uh, made by chemists. Okay, so let me just conclude. I think the time is up now. Uh, I've shown you that we do this, that we can do molecular Lego with a uh, thalassinian family. We have this Lego, uh, which uh, stacking, which people, many people have taken advantage of, not just of cells uh, uh, to do molecular electronics, solar cells, optics, and everything else. Uh, but we can also use it to assemble quantum magnets uh, with solitons and, and uh, tunable uh, ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic interactions, tunable by stacking. And, and we have rather remarkable result that we can actually by with clever stacking, you, you have orders of magnitude modulation of exchange interactions, and just, just with these, just by sliding these molecules over each other uh, qualitatively, and you can even change the sign. So this is a remarkable flexibility we have. And uh, we have the additional flexibility uh, that we have optical control of exchange interactions. So, Magnetic legal with a thalassinian family. So we can do things, control it uh, with fabrication. But of course, it's a very small step to think that, well, if the interactions are so sensitive to sliding in a, in a, that's performed during the growth process, they would presumably also be quite sent, the magnetism would be quite sensitive to driving the phonons. That, co that, that correspond to that sliding motion. So there, there's some very interesting dynamical experiments I think that one can perform in the future here. Uh, and of course, uh, I think there's a, there's a huge list of exciting experiments to do uh, once you modulate exchange interactions by actually exciting molecular orbitals. Yeah, thank you very much.